And what I've enjoyed about the event today is almost that it's been um, really like a group therapy session. It's been an opportunity to get together with hundreds of other people who are in similar industry to myself and just kind of share best practice, look at various challenges that people are facing and just um, yeah, share information really. So I was speaking about the role that boards can play in terms of driving a secure culture across the organisation. This is something that we do a lot of with the public sector organisations, where we will go and talk to a board for usually about 20 to 45 minutes, give them a bit of a scare firstly, um, but then really highlight what responsibilities they have to help drive this secure culture, because that's where the senior management need to really be pushing forward. In terms of improving engagement with the board, I think what organisations and particularly professionals need to be doing is trying to put it into very simple steps that the board needs to be doing because at the end of the day they are really busy people, they've got lots of stuff on their plates. So if we can break it down into simple steps for them, it's going to make it a lot easier for them to help drive this culture forward. So in terms of how boards can help um, cultivate a risk-aware, secure culture, what we do is we try and um, break it out into three steps for them. So we'd start by asking them to start understanding the threats. So that's looking at what potential threat actors there are in terms of um, individuals who might want to get hold of your information assets. This could be perhaps criminal gangs, could be um, maybe just people in their bedrooms wanting to try out their skills, could potentially be competitor organisations conducting a bit of corporate espionage. And there's various different actors that there could be. Um, we then ask them to think about some of the potential threats, um, well, some of the ways that these guys might actually undertake an attack. So here we might be thinking about things like phishing emails, which are getting a lot more sophisticated these days. Often attackers will undertake a bit of research on social media beforehand and then kind of tailor their attack in response to that. Um, you might also see what's called a brute force attack, which is where an attacker will use a program that will run through thousands and thousands of passwords very quickly. So if you have a dictionary word as your password, it will break through that in less than a second. Some of the other areas they might want to be looking at are things like um, actual physical breach of systems. So this could be if, um, say, a colleague just waves them through the security barriers. They might then be able to get in with a memory stick, steal things, load things onto systems. Another potential area is um, supply chain attack. So we saw this in 2014 with a US supermarket chain called Target who lost the records of 40 million customers. The attackers managed to get into this system via their ventilation suppliers because they had a weaker system. So supply chain is definitely an area to be looking out for. So once the um, board have understood the threats, we then ask them to really decide about what matters to the um, system. So these are kind of firstly identifying the information assets that the organisation can't exist without. Um, we refer to these as the crown jewel assets. Um, we then think, get them to think about um, some of the threats from earlier on and um, what, how they could potentially affect particularly these high value assets. And in response to this, set up a risk appetite because um, any business activity that we undertake is going to involve risk in some way or another. If I have an um, information asset and I encase it in concrete and sink it to the bottom of the Thames, it's probably very secure, but I'm not going to be able to use it very much in terms of my business activities. So, yeah, we just need to look at how much risk we're willing to take on to get our work done. And finally, then, we'd expect the board to try and take action on this. So in this area, they would help to develop policy along with um, lots of support from their IT experts, security, even line managers and frontline staff. So it's a great thing to get all staff on board with this thing because um, if you are setting up policies that sound great at the top of the organisation but don't actually work for frontline staff, then there is a potential that they will start developing workarounds and not following policies, which introduce a whole bunch of risks that haven't potentially been considered. Um, we would also recommend that they play this role of a cultural champion that I've mentioned a couple of times. So this is the idea that when policies are in place, they're seen to be following them, they're seen to be advocating them, because it is far easier to get staff lower down the hierarchy to take these issues seriously if they can see their senior management looking at these issues and taking them seriously themselves. 
I would define an information asset as being a body of information that can be defined and managed as a single unit. So this may be either an individual thing, like an individual file, an individual spreadsheet. It could be large physical databases. It could be large access databases, collections of workbooks. Essentially, it's things that are used for either a specific project or that a specific team are using and can be very much defined as that unit. So the first line of defence in any business is always its staff. If you have staff who are able to identify threats and know how to escalate them, it's going to make it a lot harder for people to attack you because most organisations these days will have their technical controls in place. They'll have their firewalls, their technical controls, um, but what the attacker generally needs in order to get into a system is for a member of staff to do something that they shouldn't be doing in order to let the attacker in. So we always say the bit that you can't patch is that kind of fleshy bit that sits on the end of the keyboard, and that's what a lot of this training and engagement works about.